Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute as people come in from the waiting room. Um, my name is Kate Goldman, and I'm the center manager for the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Brown University. And I'm also the head of university and academic partnerships at Respond Crisis Translation. And I'm really happy to welcome you all to this important panel discussion about the current situation in Haiti. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Brown University buildings are built on occupied indigenous lands. And we should note too, that our campus drew its early life's blood from the African slave trade in the Americas, and that there are buildings here constructed by enslaved people. These acknowledgements shared at the opening of this panel discussion should commit us to mindfulness on campus and to a lifetime of unsettling anti-racist work. I want to acknowledge the support of our center director, Patsy Lewis, for giving us the opportunity to hold this event and Respond Crisis Translation for bringing us together. Respond is a collective of language activists providing compassionate, effective, and trauma-informed interpretation and translation services for migrants, refugees, and anyone experiencing language barriers. To learn more about our work, you can visit us online at respondcrisistranslation.org. I would like to now briefly introduce our speakers before inviting them to share their remarks. Uh, we're going to start with two of my colleagues from Respond's Haitian Creole team, and we'll then invite our guest, Nicole Phillips, to speak as a representative of our partner organization, Haitian Bridge Alliance. And you're all invited to post questions or comments in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to start with Carmen Dorvali, uh, because she's actually in Haiti and her connection is pretty unstable given the situation there which she can talk about more um, when she begins. So she's worked in the hospitality administrative industry for over 12 years and is also a freelance uh, consecutive and liaison interpreter, interpreter. As a first generation Haitian, she moved back to Haiti in 2015, determined to help create positive impact in her country. She's passionate about advancing interpretation by utilizing her experience and network. And in addition to creating a positive impact for migrants and asylum seekers, she is also involved in implementing sustainable development projects aimed at creating positive social impact in a variety of communities throughout Haiti. Our second speaker will be Laura Wagner. She is the team lead for the Haitian Creole team at Respond Crisis Translation. And she's also a nonfiction writer novelist, anthropologist, and archivist. And she's currently writing a book about the history and legacy of Radio ha Haiti Inter, Haiti's most prominent independent radio station. And finally, Nicole Phillips is the legal director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, a nonprofit community organization that advocates for fair and humane immigration policies and connects migrants with humanitarian legal and social services with a particular focus on black migrants, the Haitian community, women, LGBTQ plus individuals, and survivors of torture and other human rights abuses. She's also an adjunct professor at UC Hastings College of the Law. So why don't we start with Carmen, if you are still able to connect with us. To get started, um, I am in Haiti and um, I've had the pleasure of talking and working and volunteering in Haiti with a few key organizations since um, my move to Haiti about seven years ago in 2015. Um, whether it's my work or my personal endeavors, I've seized a lot of great opportunities that we've had in Haiti. However, um, I must admit, uh, sorry for the noise, I'm outside by the way, I will have to admit that Haiti is a quite interesting place. It's full of emotion. It's a place that is not easy to understand nor to settle into. The energy in Haiti is not simple for you to wrap your hand around it. All it takes is literally one trip to the mountains, one trip across of our beautiful beaches, and that's enough. You know, it's so beautiful and so enriched. Um, for me, it's 
the question is, where would I go? I mean, this is home. This is where my roots are rooted. Um, but for someone that is outside looking in to come, you need love to remain in Haiti. It may be the love for your country, the love for your people, the food, the music, take your pick. Um, however, without love, it's a million times harder to remain in Haiti. Um, right now, we're facing one of the worst crises, in my opinion, we've ever seen. With a crippling economy, payloc agogo, meaning constantly, kidnapping, gasoline and diesel shortage, um, spiking of um, the price of gasoline up to 15 US dollars per gallon, the devaluation of the gourds, um, the deportation crisis, the gecko fleeing the country. Fear in Haiti is at an all time high. Fear of going to the bank, fear of going to the market, fear of just living your social life. The social norm is no more in Haiti right now. And um, I'm hoping that we can do better. Uh, we are at the fork in the road. We've been in many fork in the road in Haiti. However, I feel like this is the one where we need to quickly decide, do we take the high road and stand up together and fight to get our Haiti back to what it used to be? Or do we let it continue to fall into the wrong hands and become hostages in our own countries? In our own country. Um, I believe we should take the high road. I wanna fight. I wanna get Haiti back to the glory that it can be. Um, no more fixing our issues with a Band-Aid, no more temporary fixes. It's time for all the countries do our vision for Haiti. When I look at Haiti, I see a fertile land and it has given so much to so many, but has been exploited. Um, my vision is to do the opposite. I want to rebuild Haiti with brain power, smart strategies um, for desperately needed uh, social information. By enabling connections, communications, and collaboration, I'm prepared to work with any organization, any investors um, to leverage their superpowers in a positive and bring a positive ripple effect to the communities throughout Haiti. I firmly believe in a more positive Haiti. I believe it's on the horizon. You know, this is the, the, the storm before the calm, I would say. Um, if we get to work right now and get this. Thank you very much, Carmen. And we really appreciate you making this heroic effort to connect from Haiti. I know it hasn't been easy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so Laura, do you want to share your remarks with us before we move on to Nicole and then the Q&A? Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you, Kate, for organizing this, and thank you, Nicole and Carmen, for being here. I know you both have a lot of stuff going on. Um, so first, I'm going to sort of put on my academic hat, and then I'm going to put on my respond hat. Um, and the point I want to make about uh, sort of giving a bit of historical analysis of what's going on um, and what you've all seen lately uh, at the border is that none of this is new. Um, the US government designating Haitians economic migrants rather than political refugees, not new. Using public health as a justification to enact racist policy is nothing new. Um, so what we're seeing is sort of a continuation or a manifestation of patterns that are really decades long. Um, a lot of the media in referring to, um, or trying to sort of explain what happened uh, last month in Del Rio, referred to the August earthquake um, and the climate of political violence that uh, former President Jovenel Moïse fostered and that ultimately contributed to his assassination. They refer to those things as um, some of the causes of recent migration um, and, and people coming to the, uh, to the southern border of the US. Um, but those aren't the reasons that people are coming from Brazil and Chile right now, um, because 
those events are too recent. Um, however, these are really good reasons that deporting people to Haiti right now um, is immoral and cruel. Um, so I would say that the roots of the current crisis in Haiti go back centuries, um, but the most proximate causes go back um, to the early 2000s. Um, and before that, uh, when you know a series of multinational corporations and NGOs and foreign governments have kind of converged on Haiti as they have for a very long time. Um, and in 2004, when Haiti's democratically elected government was overthrown, a multi-year UN uh, so-called stabilization mission began one that ultimately uh, led to almost 10,000 Haitians dying of cholera because they introduced cholera to the country and um, committed widespread acts of sexual violence. Um, and in the context of that stabilization mission, this very long um, kind of neoliberal plan that the international community has had for Haiti that um, a lot of activists in Haiti refer to, the de refer to as the death plan, um, it was fully realized sort of in that time. So the goals, you know, subsidize imports, displace people, um, and convert Haitian land into industrial parks and mining enterprises and things like that. Um, and in the midst of this, there was sort of a counterweight, which was this money from Venezuela, which were uh, low interest loans earmarked for infrastructure and things like that. And this was, um, these are the known as the Petro Caribe funds. Um, and so 2010, shortly after the earthquake that um, I can't overstate how devastating the earthquake was, the US plays a pivotal role in ensuring that a pro-business candidate with authoritarian tendencies named Michel Martelly um, became president. Um, so the US played a direct role in ensuring that he became president. Um, and then he and his then hand-chosen successor, who was Jovenel Moïse, um, and their buddies proceeded to um, misappropriate the Petro Caribe money, which is why in 2018, Haitians took the streets demanding Cote Co Petro Caribe Alli, where's the Petro Caribe money? Um, and so this is the context of um, basically a state and a society that has been drained by international powers and then by the politicians that international powers put in power. Um, this is the context in which people were leaving seeking economic opportunity in Brazil and Chile. So um, now I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Respond and what we do. So um, as Kate mentioned, we provide um, professional level trauma-informed um, interpretation and translation services in a variety of languages, one of which is Haitian Creole. Um, and our team has been very busy lately. Um, so we've spent at this point hundreds of hours uh, with Al Otro Lao doing intakes for Haitians seeking humanitarian parole. We have provided interpretation for um, Haitian Bridge Alliance's legal clinics, which um, Nicole can tell you about. We've started doing remote interpretation for shelters in Mexico that are accommodating Haitians who um, retreated to Mexico from the border. Um, and we're now working on sort of figuring out if we can also start providing in-person uh, interpretation in Mexico. And we've done a lot of um, same day and urgent translations for a variety of organizations, um, many of which are serving people who were detained in the aftermath of what happened in Del Rio. Um, and the last thing I want to say is um, why Respond uh, feels very strongly that we should pay our Haitian Creole interpreters and translators. Um, first, because they're providing professional or professional level quality services. Um, some of our folks are in Haiti, where, as you've heard, things are precarious and work is scarce. Many others um, are immigrants themselves um, and are supporting family in Haiti. And a lot of people are experiencing a special financial vulnerability due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then finally, because as I said, this is specialized indispensable labor that we provide. The organizations that are serving migrants and asylum seekers literally cannot do their work if they're not people um, available to translate and interpret. So that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you very much, um, Laura, and thank you to you and Carmen for the critical work that you're both doing on the ground and remotely. Um, your team has really 
knocked it out of the park lately. And we know that we've asked, you've been asked to do a lot. Uh, and so we really appreciate everything you've done and the fact that you could take the time to be with us today. Um, and another very busy person is Nicole Phillips, um, especially today. And she can maybe mention a little bit about what's going on today for HBA. Um, but I'm, I'd like to welcome you to join the conversation and share your remarks today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. I, I, I want to thank you um, for, for putting on this, this panel and, and Laura and Carmen um, for helping uh, put this on and also for your great remarks. Also, thanks to the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and the Watson Institute for, um, for, for hosting this Haitian Bridge um, Alliance. We were started in 2015 by a woman um, co-founder, Garlene Joseph. There were several Haitian Americans who came together um, as sort of what Laura was discussing is um, Haitians were, had fled the United States, excuse me, had fled Haiti after the earthquake in around 2011 or so because they received visas in Brazil. Um, and so, and eventually Chile and um, in, um, as sort of the, the work dried up in Brazil, um, as the Olympics were over, as the World Cup was over, and the sources for cheap migrant labor, labor dried, um, people then became more hostile, um, as I, you also sort of saw um, the Bolsonaro government taking over Brazil, more and more Haitians started to um, not call Brazil home, not be able to stay there and fled. Many fled to Chile, um, who would then with the government of Pinero there ended up having to flee Chile. And so what you saw was starting in 2015, tens of thousands of migrants um, fleeing the Americas and coming up to Mexico into the US-Mexico border. And so uh, Galin Joseph was, was living in Southern California and heard that there are all these Haitians um, at the in Tijuana at the California San Diego border, which is not a typical, had not been a historical route for Haitians into the United States. So she got in her car and she drove down to Tijuana and said, my people, what are you doing here? Um, and herself being a Haitian immigrant, she of course really um, uh, had a big heart and felt for this community. Um, and so they explained to her the situation, but not only that, they explained all the anti-Black racism um, that they were facing on this journey that they had faced in Brazil, that they had faced in Chile, and that they had faced on this long and treacherous journey to get to the United States. Um, and so she started, along with other Haitian Americans, started Haitian Bridge Alliance to act as a um, to sort of a company Haitian migrants, both in Mexico and then in the United States when they come. And I'll talk a little bit more about our work, but I, for sort of the students out there, I think um, many um, will, we, you know, when we're in college, when we're in graduate school, we ask what difference can we make? I'm just one person and we read about all these incredible leaders out there in the world. Um, and we, we wanna be like them. And I would say that um, we can be, <laughs> you know, it was just a matter of Galene getting into her car and driving to the border and saying, um, how can I help my people? And now six years later, um, what the, uh, the, um, one of the things that Kate was sort of referring to is Galene is being awarded today the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Human Rights Award, um, which is one of the greatest human rights honors um, in the world. Um, and so where she, of course, is saying, this isn't me, this isn't for me, this is for the people, this is for my brothers and sisters who are migrants, um, who right now are trying to get to the United States, um, or who, um, you know, have been deported, it's for all Black migrants, this award. She's using this as an advocacy opportunity. And so we have Kerry Kennedy, Wycliffe Jean, um, and other stars that are, uh, on their way right now, we're, we're visiting, we're in, I'm in Tijuana right now. We're gonna be at a, a migrant shelter um, meeting with um, Haitian migrants. And then we're going to the Otay Mesa Detention Center in San Diego, which is an immigration detention center that holds um, Haitian as well as other migrants when they're detained at the US-Mexico border. And we're gonna be doing um, a pop-up concert um, and trying to promote um, stopping deportations to Haiti and ending some of the racist 
xenophobic, illegal uh, immigration policies that we have that I could talk about. Um, so that's sort of, um, you know, an example of how one woman can make a big difference and we definitely encourage it can be you know anyone she'll tell you this was not what she thought she was going to do with her life she's an engineer um she was happy being an engineer but this this issue called her um and she could not um, move forward um so I, you know i, I want to talk a little bit about um i think uh, laura mentioned um did a great description of sort of why people are leaving haiti um and carmen mentioned that it well, we're really at this precipitous in Haiti. I lived um, in Haiti for love, as, as Carmen um, described. And so it is this interesting juxtaposition. Um, Haitians don't want to leave Haiti. This is, um, they, they're leaving Haiti because they have to. Um, they're, they're leaving Haiti because a combination of factors, um, which is a political system that is so unstable that there can be, uh, Carmen mentioned, pay lock, lockdowns of the country. So imagine the lockdown we've had with COVID-19. Imagine if that lockdown is actually from insecurity, that you're afraid that your child, if you actually send her to school, um, might be kidnapped or um, have other problems, um, or that there's not enough gas, and so the generators aren't working, and so you know the school can't happen because there's no electricity. I mean, these are it's it's insecurity at its core level that is having generational effects of trauma um, on individuals and people feeling like they have to leave. There's no work, there's no security, there's no stability. And on top of that, many people themselves are victims of personal persecution or violence and that the legal system there, the law enforcement police cannot help them, will not help them either for lack of political will or for lack of resources. And so they're at, um, in this situation where we, they feel like they have no choice, they have to leave. Um, and so that is what started in 2011, people um, starting to flee, and now more and more people wanting to flee now. So what has sort of the US government's response been to this? Because it is interesting, um, we all can remember, you all might be too young to remember, but, but we can all remember about 10 years ago, 11 years ago when there was the earthquake, the United States government was really devoted to being in solidarity with you, with Haiti and rebuilding Haiti back better and doing what we could. Um, and um, as Laura mentioned, a lot of the aid assistance that happened and that was pledged to Haiti never made it. Um, and there was no accountability for that. And so unfortunately, um, Haiti really was not built up better um, with the help of the international community. There were a few projects that were helpful and, and sustainable, um, but the vast majority of it, that money went back into the pockets of US companies, um, US contractors, and so really didn't get to the Haitian people. Um, and as a result, um, we also had a lot of um, corruption as some of the aid money came in and um, um, bloated the Martelli, Michel Martelli government and caused a lot of corruption. Um, so that's been one impact of, of the, the US government, um, not to mention interfering with elections that is sort of just guaranteeing the political instability that we have now. But on, on the other hand, what you've had then is, um, which is something that the US government has, has historically done for decades, which is understand the difficulty in the country, right? So the US government, if you fast forward to 2021, um, even before the president, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated um, in July, even before August, the U.S. government recognized that there was so much instability and insecurity in the country that they redesignated Haiti for temporary protected status, which meant that the Haitian government, including the State Department, recognized that Haiti was too unsafe to send back Haitian nationals. And so every Haitian that was on US soil for the most part, as long as they qualified, um, would be granted a temporary protected status. They would be granted a work permit and they would be granted protection against deportation. Um, and then you had the assassination and then you had the earthquake. Um, and yet the US government saw fit 
to be able to deport, start deporting Haitians back. So on the one hand, you have the US government saying, we're in solidarity with the people after even just the 2021 earthquake, which took about over 2000 lives, um, destroyed uh, tens of thousands of homes um, and really devastated sort of the south of the country. So on the one hand, they're saying, we're in solidarity, whatever we can do for the government of Haiti, we're willing to do it. On the other hand, they're recognizing it's too unsafe to be deporting patients. And then on the other hand, they're saying, we're gonna now deport. And in the last month, they've deported 8,000 patients on about 76 airplanes. There were so many deportation flights in the last month. These are people that were under the bridge in Del Rio, Texas, that we all heard about. There were so many people that the, Haitian, the US government wanted to deport that they had to open up another airport in the north of the country. And that airport, mind you, didn't had, hadn't handled deportations, didn't know, didn't have the infrastructure to deal with this mass amount of people being repatriated to their country. They had to borrow buses and other um, tools from NGOs and the community in order to respond. So it really has, the US government has created its own crises in Haiti by deporting this amount of people. Um, and, and, and one of the main problems with this is not only are we creating the US government, creating crises in Haiti, but there's also been a series of immigration policies over the last couple of decades whose aim, whose goal is to keep Haitian bodies, to keep Haitian refugees, in particular to keep black bodies off of US soil. And I think it's really important for us to look at this from a racism lens, an anti-black racism lens. And so when you look at the US government's policies back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, where the US supported the Jean-Claude Duvalier and the Francois Duvalier dictatorship, the baby, baby doc and papa doc. The US government funded largely this dictatorship that spanned three decades that is reportedly, Laura is gonna know a lot more about this than I will, but is reportedly one of the most brutal dictatorships of the 20th century, which given what was happening in Chile and Brazil and other places in the region is pretty significant. The US government funded it. And so by no surprise, by the 1970s and 80s, you had boats fleeing Haiti, coming to US shores, seeking asylum. And the US government's response to this, right? This is its um, sort of paradoxical response that I was talking about before. The response was to interdict, interdict the boats and send them back to Haiti and or eventually Guantanamo Bay as we know it today of holding people from in the 9-11 fiasco of, of, of a war. Um, not, Guantanamo Bay off of the shores of, in, in Cuba were, was started for Haitian refugees to hold black bodies because the US government didn't want the refugees coming onto US soil. Um, eventually, after um, many lawsuits for Haitian refugees, but in 1981, the detention system, immigration detention system as we know it today, was started by President, started by President Ronald Reagan in order to hold Haitian refugees, in order to criminalize um, and, and penalize, punish Haitian refugees from trying to seek asylum. Um, and so that's the entire detention system we know that has um, been swollen has held as many as 40,000 immigrants at one time. Right now, I think the numbers are around the 20,000s. Um, but this whole idea of, of criminalizing, of um, punishing um, migrants for seeking asylum, this came in response to Haitians. Um, fast forward to 2016, going back to that wave of Haitians that Geraldine saw in Tijuana coming back. The President Obama's response to Haitians coming across the Tijuana in, in San Diego border was not to welcome them with open arms, was not to make sure that they had legal access to asylum protection. President Obama and Biden, their administration, was to create a policy called metering, where they made sure that Haitians asylum seekers would not be able to come onto U.S. soil, but that they would have to take a number 
as if they're in line for ice cream to take a number. And then when their number was called many months later, if at all, they would be allowed to process their asylum claim. And this created this policy of migrants being stuck in Mexico, which is on the border, has created an entire market with the cartels, with the gangs um, for, for trafficking. Um, and for exploitation of migrants. And as you can imagine, in a country of Mexico where less than 2% of the population self-identify as, as Negro, as Black, it means that Haitian migrants and other Black migrants stand out. It's very easy for traffickers and, and the coyotes and the, um, the gangs to, to know who they are and to exploit them. And we've been, we've you know interviewed hundreds of migrants and many of them talk about violence that's happening to them um, at the U.S.-Mexico border while they're waiting to cross over. So this is a whole market of, of violence and exploitation that U.S. immigration policies has heard about in the news was they, you know, the, U the U.S. government, this was under um, Trump, said, all right, well, maybe we need to allow some Haitian or some migrants to come across the border, but we're going to make them wait in Mexico um, remain in Mexico while they're processing this under the MPP program, Migrant Protection Protocol, you've probably heard about. Um, that was a problematic because again, it was not allowing Haitian or any migrant to come into the US, but that actually excluded Haitians specifically. It was only for people in Latin America who spoke Spanish and Brazilians. It was basically Haitians need not apply <laughs> for this. And so what that meant was there was no way for Haitians to even seek asylum into the United States. And then the last policy is Title 42. And Title 42 started in March of 2020 by the Trump administration. It was um, the brainchild of um, um, Stephen Miller, um, who many of us have heard of is sort of this evil immigration policy wonk for the, Biden, for the um, Trump administration. He started this policy, he was looking for a way to use this health and security code um, called Title 42 um, in the US, he was looking for, a, ironically, a pandemic, some major health concern that he could use this policy for to exclude migrants um, at the US-Mexico border. Um, and then he got lucky uh, because COVID happened. And so it was already in waiting. It already had been sort of a legal memo that was floating around the Trump administration. Um, and what it says was, what Title 42, is, it allows the US government to not allow in certain migrants because, or certain immigrants or migrants because they um, have a health, um, because they have some sort of a health um, concern that could be, um, could spread into the United States, a communicable disease. So for example, um, mumps, measles, or rubella, or, um, or, or tuberculosis. Um, but those are generally people who have had that, um, been diagnosed with that medical concern. And what they did was they expanded this broadly and said, any migrant at all who um, tries to come into the United States is going to be prohibited from coming into the United States, notwithstanding if they could be tested, notwithstanding if they've been vaccinated, notwithstanding any of these things that could show that they possibly are not bringing in COVID. Um, it is a blanket exclusion for all of them coming across. If you've got a visa, you're okay. If you come in by air, on an airplane, you're okay. You cannot cross. So it clearly was, was targeted um, at, at migrants. Um, and the other problem to this is that um, it allows them to immediately expel these migrants without offering them asylum protection. So all, imagine all these Haitian migrants who've come across this long journey from Brazil Chile all the way up through the Darien Gap, through Central America. The journey takes between four and six weeks generally and is extremely traumatic. Imagine having that entire journey all the way coming up to the US-Mexico border to be deported and not even be allowed to seek asylum um, because of persecution they may have experienced into the United States. So it's not only cruel, uh, it's not only be um, inhumane, but it also is legal under both do U.S. domestic law and international basic laws of providing refugees with a chance of seeking asylum. Um, I think what's most discouraging is that the Biden administration has taken 
um, this Title 42 policy and embraced it and added to it. Um, there have been many, many times over more deportations in particular to Haiti um, under the Biden administration as there was under the Trump administration. And so that is the fate of most of the people in Del Rio, especially the ones as we saw were so brutally or just um, kind of grossly whipped at by men on horses from border patrol. Um, you know, what happened to those individuals some were allowed into the country, into the United States. Those that were allowed in did not get weren't given work authorization, likely will to be deported in a number of months or years. And the other ones were all deported back to Haiti. And this is the U.S. government's response to this crisis in Haiti. Stop these deportations immediately. Um, thank you so much. I'll leave my I'll leave um, that there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Nicole, um, and to all of you. Uh, we are so grateful to have the three of you here with us. And um, I know that we're facing a lot of technical challenges right now, but we did hear um, everything that you said, despite the Tijuana Hotel internet connection and the difficulties in Haiti on the ground right now that Carmen's dealing with. So um, I'm super grateful, um, and especially to Alex Laferrier, who's helping us with the tech. Um, I just feel very lucky to be listening to everything that you have to say, and I'm sure that our audience does too. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, and, and if you are an attendee, feel free um, to add more. Um, the first question, which we've marked as answered, was if um, Nicole could repeat the name of the woman who won the RFK award, and that's Gerlene Joseph, the director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance. So. Um, you will probably be hearing a lot more about her award today. And if you're on um, Immigration Rights Twitter, you've already been <laughs> hearing about it nonstop for the past 12 to 18 hours or so, which is fantastic. Um, but the first question is from Natalia Roman, and it's for Laura. It says, you mentioned that the former president had pushed a violent propaganda that then led to his assassination. Can you discuss this more and talk about the ramifications you've heard about as a result of the assassination? Uh, yeah, I can definitely answer that. But I also, um, depending on how Carmen's connection is, if, if her connection is good right now, I would jump to uh, the, the question that's directed to her and then I can come back if you want. Carmen, can you hear us? The question for you was, uh, what role do, can, or should the surrounding islands and territories like the DR, PR, and others play in the situation in Haiti? With the situation in Haiti, unfortunately, I believe that we can only fix our own problems at home. However, what the surrounding countries could do to help us is welcome us with open arms. The ones that are fleeing, the ones that are seeking a better life, better education, I believe they should be welcome. I believe if Haiti is the only I think that we've lost Carmen's audio, but um, she was just saying that one of the things that other territories and countries could do is welcome the Haitians who are fleeing with open arms. So uh, Laura and Nicole, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, I would add, um, and I'm not an expert on this, um, but I, I know, you know some of the history. Um, there's a very, very long history of anti-Haitian racism in the Dominican Republic um, that goes back a very long time. Um, you know, in 1937, Trujillo ordered the army to kill um, Haitians and then people who they thought might be Haitian or people of Haitian descent along the border. Um, in 2013, I believe you had La Sentencia, which basically uh, revoked the citizenship of uh, anyone of Haitian descent um, in the Dominican Republic. And um, 
And a lot of the rhetoric that you know that that you hear if you you know listen to you know right wing uh, sort of Dominican thought um, is in some ways very reminiscent of the same things you hear in the U.S. They're coming to take our jobs. Or blah 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 blah. They don't have the same cultural values as us. Um, so that's just to say that um, you know the country that is closest geographically to Haiti. Um, that shares an island with Haiti. Um, but there's a very complicated history there. I like this question though. I think it's a really good question because it's focusing, it's, it's de-emphasizing the United States. It's de-emphasizing France, Canada, um, and Great Britain. Um, and it's sort of saying, what about the neighbors? What what it roles could they should they be playing? And agree that the, the relationship with the Dominican Republic is extremely complicated. Um, but I, I, there seems to be a need for more solidarity in the region um, with Haiti. And so, and of course, Carmen sentiment needs is is you know 100 and needs to be. Um, uplifted more, which is that um, Haitians, you know, it's it's hate, Haitians need to rebuild Haiti. On the other hand, there could be more solidarity with countries like in the in the time of Hugo uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, there were there was solidarity um, that was a really important partner was was Venezuela, um, as well as countries from CARICOM, the um, Caribbean nations, um, as as well as um, Cuba, of course, is, is, is a big um, solidarity partner and has provided a lot of doctors and training of doctors and these types of things. So when we're talking about in a humanitarian development range um, or area, it, I think countries in the region where there's going to be a lot more, um, hopefully a lot less racism, although not in the case of the Dominican Republic, um, hopefully less racism and hopefully more cultural understanding and more solidarity and a little less big brother United States neoliberal policies, that that kind of solidarity and equal partnership, I think would be the model. Um, I agree though with, with on, the, um, on the migration issues because we do have um, deportations happening from the Bahamas, from Cuba um, and other places in the region as well. And so, and that is, um, that is tricky, but um, of course it's a tricky, it's a complicated issue. Um, but, certainly Haiti needs a lot more solidarity um, with those countries in terms of receiving mig migrants um, as well. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give the, the floor to uh, the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Patsy Lewis, who has her hand up. Thank you, Kate. I have my hand up because I feel that as somebody from the Caribbean, and whose country is a member of the Caribbean community and who works on, on CARICOM that I you know, should at least make some comments. I think I agree that the Caribbean definitely should be more at the forefront in coming up with certainly a policy on um, asylum seekers from Haiti. And as far as I'm aware, there's not a region-wide approach. So it's basically ad hoc countries doing their own thing. Um, Bahamas has historically had quite a large number of Haitians migrating to, ba to the Bahamas. Um, some legally a lot undocumented or documented, undocumented. And that the problem with most Caribbean countries is that they're really very small. And Haiti has 11 million people. So there's that kind of fear that and they don't have the resources to deal with large influx of people. Um, so I think that's one of the sensitivities. But I think that CARICOM could actually have more of a policy and they would definitely need support they don't have the fits, you know, they would need places to put people, you know, um, more facilities and those things cost money. But I think that that's something that if there is a political will, that at least um, so, something can, can, a way forward can be found. 
Similarly with Venezuela, Venezuela, Trinidad, because of its proximity to Venezuela, has borne a disproportionate burden of um, movement from Venezuela. So I so clearly there's a need for a regional wide approach. The other problem that CARICOM has is that even though Haiti is a member of CARICOM, CARICOM is not really that involved in Haiti's political life or when there are challenges. The US, I mean, the current government went, has gone straight to the US to intervene. Um, it hasn't gone to CARICOM to look for ways in which, you know, um, the region can help. And I very much take Carmen's point that Haiti is for Haitians to, to resolve. But, you know, if there's a positive role that the CARICOM region can play, then I think that, you know, that's also legitimate. But the tendency has been to rely on Big Brother. And the US, the US does not really acknowledge a role for CARICOM in um, Haiti's political life. No, having the floor, I'd like to ask Carmen a question. Um, Carmen, you mentioned that you wanted, one of the things you wanted for Haiti was investment. And I want to sure. know what kind of investment you're talking about, what kind of economy you're seeing for um, Haiti, especially since both Laura and Nicole already suggested that it's not that there haven't been investments, but it's what kind of investment for whom? And how do you see um, your economic vision addressing a lot of the social problems that Haiti has? Thank you. So um, to answer that is my vision comes from, um, you know, after seeing a lot of other countries um, get their act together, like Rwanda, um, which one is, which is one of the major ones. And when I when I think about economic and people coming in to invest, I really don't mean money. I mean um, knowledge. I mean uh, people coming in and meeting with. Is whether it's a private sector, governmental, uh, uh, governmental, educational, it's community coming back home and, you know, teaching us what they've learned so that we as an economy can grow. What, what happens a lot in Haiti is that a lot of people, me as well, um, we go out and we get our education in other countries because our country is so unstable right now we stay where we are so we don't bring back that knowledge that we went out and helped so my vision is is that once haiti learns how to collaborate you know the people of haiti once we learn to collaborate with one each other i've, I've read a book from adam kahan called collaborating with the enemy once we learn how to work with each other and trust each other to bring haiti To the next level, I was investing the fast food chain. We can have different things that other, you know, Caribbeans have that Haiti had yet to catch up to. Meaning, we can stop using, you know, a la me to say, uh, you know, handwritten banks. We don't have a a, a good bank um, system at the point. So, bringing the right brain powers to Haiti to, you know, elevate these things. will literally enhance everything is just getting the knowledge back home and us learning to work with each other so that we can do better i hope i answered your question um i might jump in here and get back to natalia's question that we that we sort of skipped over and come back to um so i i the first thing i want to say is that there were a lot of people killed before Jovenel Moïse was killed in Haiti. There were high school students, there were doctors in their 60s, there were nurses coming from work. Um, there are a lot of ordinary people. One week before Moïse was killed, I think one week to the day, 
there was a, a massacre in which um, a women's rights activist named Antoinette Duclair and a journalist named Diego Charles were both killed. And I suspect that, you know, sort of outside the echo chamber that um, either Haitian people or people who pay a lot of attention to what's going on in Haiti, people who are outside that echo cham chamber probably never heard those names. Um, and so I think, I think there's this sense of, the, 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 for me, there's a sense that these are the names that we should be talking about, and these are the deaths that we should be talking about. And there's also a sense that, wow, if the president can't get justice, then um, what about everybody else? Um, so Jovenel Moïse did not principally uh, sort of promote violent propaganda. He underwrote violence and massacres and gangs. And um, so, so this is what I'm referring to when I say that, um, you know, in the end, he was sort of devoured by the climate of insecurity that he fostered is it wasn't just on the level of language, it was on the level of funding and arming people. Um, as far as the ramifications of the assassination, I think it's all incredibly strange. <laughs> I think um, there's a lot of uh, things that have not been elucidated as far as the assassination goes. And, and I don't know that there ever will be. Um, sort of the direct ramifications, he had nominated a new prime minister the day before he was killed, but that person had not yet come into office. Um, and then normally in the case of, um, you know, a presidential assassination or, you know, a president who can no longer, who needs to be, um, who can no longer do the job, the, the head of the coup de cassation, which is the, the Supreme Court in Haiti would normally take over, except that that guy had just died of COVID. So it was this really this kind of perfect storm for, um, <laughs> to make things unstable. And, and I'll add that before, you know, Jovenel was basically, a lot of people feel that he was ruling by decree. There was sort of a, a constitutional question of um, when his term ended. And a lot of people in the popular sector in Haiti felt that it ended in February and so that he was really a de facto president. Um, but meanwhile, he enjoyed bipartisan support from the United States. So he wasn't going anywhere. Um, and at the same time, the US was saying then, and, and even more so after his assassination, um, they're saying, okay, Haiti needs to organize elections. But that sounds good in theory, right? Like elections are good. Um, but this is not a government that can organize free and fair elections. Um, and also there's just not that much of a government because he eliminated a huge number of elected offices in the country so that there were just a handful of people in political office throughout the country and they were all his people. So I don't have that much like a conclusion about this except to say that it's, um, it's a real mess. That's the ramifications. Thank you, um, Laura uh, and Carmen for your response as well. Um, Dr. Empke wanted to let you know that he thought these were all three excellent presentations. And he had a question for all of you. Do you see any realistic hope for changing the US's racist anti-Haitian immigration policies given how long standing and vigorous they are? So I don't know if, if you wanna start with that, Nicole. Um, and then we can sort of circle back. Sure, I, I, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and I, I, I do think that there's hope. And, and part of the reason is that um, I think what we saw in 2020 with the uprisings um, and change of a slight shift of consciousness around the George Floyd murder, um, I think we're seeing now this consciousness around anti-Black racism and everywhere that it is. And so the fact that um, this panel is happening today. The fact that there is so much out there in the news today about 
these deportations to Haiti um, and, and seeing it in this framework, this lens of really showing that the Biden administration's um, immigration policies are antiquated, are xenophobic um, and are racist is a first step. It hasn't ended Title 42 policies, um, but I think we are gonna win that and I think that it will. Um, and so there is, you know, even the anti-immigrate or the anti, um, or I should say the pro-immigrant rights community pre-George Floyd, pre-summer of last year was quite racist, right? Black voices were not heard. Um, black immigrant voices were invisible and were excluded in myriad different ways. And so after that moment, we saw a shift in the pro-immigrants rights movement where they started realizing um, their internalized anti-Black racism um, and started including um, thinking more about um, the impacts of these policies um, on, on, on Black migrants. Because as you can imagine, being in the United States um, as a migrant, you already have the, the, the stigma and the discrimination against you as a migrant, and then adding on top of that layers of being in a black body, um, and then la laying on top of that layers of perhaps being a woman or LGBTQ or having um, some form of, of a disability makes it um, really, really tricky. So I do think that the consciousness is shifting and that that is the first thing that we need to do along with the consciousness there is more and more, there are more and more people that are coming out and denouncing um, and that we're hoping that under the Biden administration that there will be enough members of the Congressional Black Caucus, of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, of others um, who will stand out and say, we will not take this any longer. Um, and we are seeing, I think, little by little, the fruits of that. Having Haiti be redesignated for TPS was a major sign of that, that in of itself will help about 155,000 Haitian um, nationals that are in the United States. So that's a big help. Um, but the question of course is big. I mean, we're looking at, at decades, if not centuries um, of racism. Um, and, and so how do you change that? But I think it, it will come in fits and starts um, as we've seen it. And that there is, that the black immigrants rights movement is falling on the coattails of all this amazing work that was done um, under the name of George Floyd and all the other um, um, you know, African-Americans that were killed by law enforcement. Um, yeah, so I think it's coming in that, 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 con that wave of, of consciousness. Um, I actually had another question for any of you, um, but it's one thing that Nicole mentioned. So this event is part of our Sawyer seminar um, on this topic, this topic of migration um, in the Americas. And one of the approaches that we have for this entire year of events or year plus of events is going to be decentering the US. Um, and so this goes back to the question that we had earlier about other Caribbean nations or communities that might be able to provide support to Haiti or show solidarity with Haiti. Um, and then Nicole, you mentioned specifically the Darien Gap, which I think is something that you three are probably hearing a lot about, but that isn't talked about at all in the US. Uh, and so I was wondering if one of you might be able to um, talk a little bit more about that. So we have, Haitian nationals who are coming from Brazil and Chile, and probably a few from other countries, I would imagine, but mainly from Brazil and Chile. And they're coming up the entire length of the Americas, right, up until the US-Mexico border. And one of the critical points there is the Darien Pass. So if maybe if you could talk a little bit more about that, I think it's, it's something really critical that isn't getting a lot of attention in these conversations. Yeah, sure. And we actually, we wrote a report that I can put a link in the chat um, that came out in January and we interviewed 30 Haitian women in, um, in Chiapas on the Mexico-Guatemalan border. Um, and we asked them about um, sort of their journey was the main questions and how they were being treated in Mexico. And we covered a lot about this Darien Gap. 
the stories that we heard, which are similar to the stories that I heard, I was in Tapachula and Chiapas a couple weeks ago. So it's similar um, stories happening now, is that um, in order to you know, get into Mexico, you've got to cross through Cuba, excuse me, through Colombia into the jungles um, and this area, this border between Panama and Colombia, which is considered, they call it the Darien Gap. And it's about a um, hundred kilometers of uh, rainforest, dense rainforest. So people are traveling by foot. Um, there's a part where they have to cross the river as well, um, but they're traveling this all by boat, boat um, excuse me, by foot. And they have no um, access to hotels or restaurants or stores or anything like that. It's the middle of the jungle. So you really survive on what you can bring with you. Um, Haitians tend to travel in groups of 20 to 30 to I heard as big as groups of 80 people. Um, there are other migrants. They're hoping to have security in numbers. Um, but what happens to every single migrant I have spoken to who's gone through this, every single one, um, is that they're robbed at gunpoint um, by, by groups of gangs, unclear um, their affiliation. Um, and that these robberies, um, sometimes they'll just say, everybody put in 20 bucks um, and everybody in the group puts in $20. But other times they steal all their food, all their drinking water, their legal documents like passports, their telephones, all of their money. Um, and so people are left without anything, any food. Um, there were many stories I heard of people having to go with babies for as many as 12 days walking through this jungle without any food at all, that they're surviving on salt tablets um, and water from the, the rivers, which of course is giving them dysentery. Um, I've heard increasingly um, reports, so this is a trigger warning, it certainly was for me as I was doing these interviews, um, but I have heard increasing reports of sexual assault um, against women, sort of taking girls and women aside um, and, and sexually assaulting them. Um, and then I've heard reports of finding those perpetrators when they arrive in Panama at the refuge center, identifying them, um, and that migrants who wanted to press charges against them and wanted accountability would show up dead the next day after they reported that. Um, and so most migrants do not report um, the crimes that were committed against them when they get to Panama, unfortunately. So it's um, particularly with women um, in interviewing them, it's that a lot of times the eyes will glaze over. You can see trauma coming back to them as they're talking to us about that journey. And it is something that um, they've said, um, a, a phrase that I heard over and over again is that this will mark their lives. This will mark their lives for the rest of their life. It was such a traumatic journey. And I think it's important to keep this in mind. I mean, I'm glad you asked this question. I think it's important to keep this in mind when we think about kind of what have Haitian migrants gone through in terms of what do they experience in their country? What traumas? Did they lose people in the earthquake? Um, what kind of persecution did they flee? But then also their, their journey through this Darien Gap, what sort of trauma are they arriving to, arriving with um, on our doorstep in the US? And what is the US government's response to this trauma, which is to place more trauma upon them and deport them. But I think we as Americans, to the extent people are allowed into the United States, we need to be treating Haitian migrants with open arms um, and so much love and solidarity because they really have been through um, sort of M many of them have been through sort of unimaginable um, um, trauma and journeys. Thank you, Nicole. Um, there's a related question from my colleague, Kristen Collins, who's our Sawyer Seminar postdoctoral fellow. And she said, thanks so much for sharing with us and for the important work you're all doing. Could you speak more about transit routes and conditions for Haitians? I'm especially interested in learning about how anti-Blackness affects folks moving through Central America. Yeah, sure. So um, um, the way anti-Black um, racism is sort of affecting is that as, um, so the transit routes, there's one particular route that everybody seems to take whether it's from Brazil or from Chile, and they all come through Bolivia, 
Ecuador, I'm not looking at the map right now, but they sort of come through the most, you know, all the countries to pass through uh, all through Central America. Um, and these countries have sort of accepted and understand because there's been hundreds of thousands of migrants, most of them black. So this isn't just the migrant route for Haitians. This is the migrant route for many people from Africa, particularly Cameroon, we've seen Togo, um, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, oh, so many, so many different countries in Africa, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, those who've decided that it's not safe to go through the Mediterranean and sort of the European route, this is now a new route that is considered safer um, for them to come through because they don't have to go through, you know, take boats across the Mediterranean. Um, and so, uh, yes, these countries are sort of used to them passing through it. Um, I would say Chile is where we've seen the most um, racism has been really, the stories coming out of Chile of racism have been really sort of haunting. Um, the one that sticks out the most is a woman who was nine months, who fled, you know, she went to law school, she was very educated in Haiti. She and her, her partner met in law school and um, they fled Haiti because of political persecution. And she was seven, she was nine months pregnant in labor, her water had broke. They spoke a bit of Spanish. They went into the hospital in Chile in order to, for her to deliver. And the hospital refused to accept her in. She was delivering and the hospital refused. So she delivered right outside the hospital um, on the streets. And once the baby was born, they um, agreed to treat the baby. Um, so, I mean, I think that's sort of a, it's been a symbolic in my mind. There's been stories after stories I've heard of this type of hostility um, against Haitians living in Chile, not people not paying them for their wages, people working on construction contracts for days or weeks, not being paid for their work. Um, just um, uh, lots of racial epithets being said that people are understanding as they're hearing it. Um, both in Brazil and Chile. In terms of traveling up, you know, we know these countries generally are, do not have large black populations. So again, Haitians and other black migrants really stick out. Um, what we're seeing is a lot of um, exploitation um, as they're passing through their countries. We've heard of stories um, of a lot of racial profiling on sort of the buses that people are traveling through, guards, uh, police or immigration, officials coming onto the buses, taking off all the black people um, who they were presuming to be migrants and undocumented um, and extorting them, having them pay for money. Sometimes there is some violence against them, although fortunately I don't hear that very often. Um, and that each country sort of treats them differently. Um, there's been some deportations. So for example, they'll get into Guatemala and Guatemala will deport them into Honduras. Um, but then they'll just go through Guatemala again into Mexico. Um, Mexico, there's been a lot of problems in Mexico. You've got this population of right now tens of thousands of Haitian and other migrants in Tapachula, which is a which is a pretty small town, border town um, in Chiapas. And so um, the Mexican government is not authorizing um, legal documents for Haitians to leave Tapachula, like humanitarian visas, which is permitted under the law or to be able to transfer their asylum cases to other jurisdictions in Mexico, which is permitted under the law. But Mexico was not um, allowing those to, um, to be applied to Haitian migrants. And so they're being stuck there waiting to adjudicate their asylum claims. But in the meantime, there's no work for them. It's hard for them to find housing. They feel like they're in a prison. Um, and a lot of this is dictated from the US government which is saying to Mexico, which is saying to Panama, to Guatemala, to Honduras, keep migrants away from the US-Mexico border. Um, you know, militarize your borders, put in more national guards. We will, um, we will up our um, trade tariffs if you don't, right? This is something, the famous tweet that um, Trump sent to Mexican President Obrador, which was, um, we will reduce, we will increase our tariffs against Mexican goods if you do not keep migrants away from the US-Mexico border. Um, and this is being echoed in the Biden administration. He's much more friendly about it, but it's the same messaging coming from this government. Um, and so that is creating other governments that is facilitating other governments from now violating Haitian migrants' rights as well and is creating this geopolitical crisis um, in the Americas.
Thank you, Nicole. Um, did Carmen or Laura want to add anything? No, I think um, Nicole handled that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I guess the next question that's from Jared is what kind of political forces exist within Haiti that may be inhibiting growth? And maybe we could start with you, Carmen, for that question. And Laura, feel free to um, help answer this one as well. I think I'm gonna um, pass this one to Laura because <laughs> um, I don't see it. Um, yeah, so I think I would probably start by um, by turning the question around a bit and asking what what you mean by growth or what we mean by growth, because I think a lot of the things that have adversely affected Haiti have been done in the name of so-called growth or so-called development. And you know, the, these are terms that on their face appear positive and innocuous, but I think that they in practice can uh, conceal a lot, of, a lot of violence, a lot of structural violence. Um, but if, if the question is, you know, sort of what, what are some political forces in Haiti that, I don't even know how to put it, <laughs> that, um, that have been destructive toward, toward Haitian people, um, I think there are a lot, right? I think that there, um, and, 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 and in a way it's sort of been like the same story and the same kinds of power changing their names and um, employing slightly different tactics, but kind of remaining at heart the same. So, you know, Duvalier, as Nicole mentioned, um, both Duvalier, so that was an almost 30 year hereditary dynasty, um, had a regime of terror. And in, it, it was, uh, people knew where, where the violence was coming from. It was coming from the army and it was coming from the paramilitary, the, the Tonto Makut. And, um, when Duvalier finally fell from power, which is kind of its own story, um, there, there was a new Haitian constitution. And in that constitution, there was Article 291. And it said that um, members of the Duvalier government were not permitted to run for political office for 10 years. Um, and this was a reaction to the fact that some 50,000 people had been killed under Duvalier and there was torture. There had been, as Nicole mentioned, um, waves of migration because people uh, had you know, been dispossessed of their land and, and could not live, which is again why there in my mind is no um, real difference between political migration and economic, being an economic or um, economic migration and being a political refugee because how can you separate the political from the economic? Anyway, there was a big backlash to Article 291 and um, it, that resulted in um, several coups, but the, the big coup in 1991, um, where the army overthrew the democratically elected government under Aristide for the first time and unleashed like three years of um, absolute terror. Um, so without getting sort of too long about this, um, I think in some ways what you, you know, what I've sort of heard is some people are kind of nostalgic for the Duvalier years because they say, well, at least then you knew where the violence was coming from. Now it's disseminated, now it's generalized. Now you feel like you're not safe no matter what you do. Um, I'm not Haitian, so you know it's kind of weird for me to have a dog in this fight. But um, I, I'm, I'm personally cautious about that nostalgia in the way that I'm nostal uh, that I'm skeptical of sort of anyone who has nostalgia for a fascist regime anywhere in the world, including in the country that I was born in. Um, but my point is that those people are still there. Um, literally, the Duvaliers are still there. So, you know, people talk about Nicolas Duvalier running for office um, in the future and, um, and various other people that might, whose names might not be as recognizable. Um, 
but that um, continue to resurface. Michel Martelly was a huge sympathizer of the 1991 coup and surrounded himself by old guard Duvalieris. So I guess my point is that in some ways, the political forces that within Haiti that um, are harming people are the same ones that have been existing for decades, but that have sort of, you know, changed their stripes, changed their style, um, changed some of their methods, but that at heart um, kind of have the same core. Thank you, Laura. So the, there's one final question from another colleague of ours from Respond, Joanne Gustav. Uh, and she says, you know, how does Haiti move forward? Should elections happen this year? How do we build infrastructure in this climate when gangs have more power than the police? Um, and so I'd like to ask you um, each to maybe give your final reflections um, using that question as a, as a jumping off point as we sort of wrap it up here. Um, so what, what do you think is next for Haiti? What do you think should come next? I believe that we, we shouldn't do elections this year. I, that's my honest opinion. I think we need to stabilize what is happening now and focus on the issues we have at hand now, like um, removing all these gangs that we have, getting all the manpower that we need to um, get Haiti back on track. Now, I believe if we do things right, maybe we'll be ready for elections by the end of next year. That's the big maybe. And um, I, although there may not be a, a government party that I feel can bring change to Haiti right now, I do believe that there has been organizations created that can bring hope to Haiti. And ancien chef gang sit down with the Aped and an Andal and have a conversation and come to a mutual understanding, then yes, you know, things can get better for Haiti moving forward if they can just come to an amicable term. Um, the infrastructure in Haiti, um, this goes back to we need to fix with the problem at hand. Um, it's removing the gang violence, stopping the kidnapping. Right now, we don't know who's responsible for these kidnappings. If, is it really the gangs? Is it really the governments? Um, I just believe that we should focus with the crisis we have at hand now before we move forward into asking any other question. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Laura, do you want to give us a, a couple of final remarks? Yeah, um, and I'm going to actually try to, I feel that I've been very doom and gloom, so I'm going to um, uh, try to say something different from what I've been saying. Um, first, some doom and gloom, um, which is, I similarly, I don't think, um, I don't think that this idea of sort of elections at all costs, elections as the final goal, elections as sort of the be all and end all um, is, is, is what anybody should be working for right now in a context where, as I mentioned before, the current government in Haiti such as it is, is not in a position um, or I think would not want to um, organize truly democratic elections. Um, all that said, in looking at, um, where did it go? In looking at Joanne's question um, about infrastructure, um, what it makes me think about and what I think I haven't emphasized enough in what I've said today is um, the incredible resource and um, potential of, of ordinary people in Haiti. Um, the thing personally that sort of acts as my compass and the way that I think about the world is what we saw in the aftermath of the earthquake in 2010, in the immediate aftermath. And what you saw in the immediate aftermath was people saving their neighbors, people saving each other, and 
and this sense that, you know, for the first time in a long time, people feared the walls that, um, that could crumble more than they feared the people that those walls were built to keep out. Um, and that's the thing I think about all the time um, because I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for that decency um, that people showed in that moment. And so I think that the reason that that sort of Haiti is held together at all is that in the midst of all of these macro structural factors that are um, really designed to destroy life, um, that there's a great deal of solidarity among people. There are old traditions that go back hundreds of years like uh, which is sort of a like collective labor practice or laku where people you know live together and share resources. And I think that these things are all still, they all still exist. Um, and, and I think that that's really the most beautiful thing um, that, I, that I see in Haiti and the greatest strength. Thank you, Laura. And Nicole, do you wanna give us your final thoughts for today at least? That was so beautiful what Laura said. Um, and I, you know, um, hard to sort of match that. And I agree, of course, with what Carmen said. I think the one thing in terms of what can we, you know, as the US and as American voters and sort of US foreign policy about this is I um I, I would say that the the US government, we need to make sure that the military is not sent. Um, often when you have so much of the gang violence and instability, um, what has happened in the past is that the US government has sent in the Marines um, and militarized the situation. I don't think in the long term or even in the short term, that's really going to help. So, um, so no to, to the increased militarization, no to, as Carmen mentioned, no to immediate elections. Um, the, if elections were to happen today, we would just be in the exact same situation um, down the road because it's the exact same people that are, are running the current government that would be holding and controlling the elections that would be making sure that their buddies in this kleptocracy won the election. So we wouldn't end up with a better situation as we are now. That would just be a band-aid. Um, and I, I think this does need to be a Haitian-driven solutions um, there is a commission for civil society that has come together within Haiti um, that um, has a lot of recommendations for a transitional government that would allow more time for elections to happen and that would focus on the police and rooting out gang violence. And so I think as an international community, more um, focus, and that's what really one of our primary things in our advocacy is to highlight um, and to empower um, the, the voices from within this Commission for Civil Society and, and implement, um, allow them to implement a transition government. The problem is when the US government puts its hand on the scale, when it, it props up and acknowledges the current leadership in Haiti, whether that was the Duvaliers or President Martelly, President Jovenel who was assassinated or the current prime minister, when the US government puts their weight behind it and, and um, that ends up, um, they end up being the most powerful. Um, it really tips the scale against opposition that's trying to create different forms of change. And so the US really needs to remove its fingers, its toes, everything off of these scales and allow Haitian civil society um, to direct um, what they, how, how to run their own country. And I think that is where we're gonna see actual real change in, in the country. Thank you all for um, your wisdom and for your generosity with your time and for joining us today. Um, Patsy, did you wanna add anything before we close? Well, just to say thanks. I think it was a <laughs> really good discussion, lots of rich material and details. So thank you 
all very much. So I wanted to say that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, Patsy, for your support for this program and Alex for your support as well. Um, and a couple of people have asked in the comments when a recording of this will be available and the answer is it will be available soon on the CLACS website and we invite you to check it out if you missed anything and to share it and of course um, also check out our upcoming events as part of the Sawyer seminar and our other CLACS programming so thank you all again so much for joining us have a great day <laughs>